Hey, hello and welcome everyone. This is Chris Marquardt. You're listening to Tips from the Top Floor. This time uh, it might sound a little different because I'm recording outside in the... Okay, what's the name of the valley? That's a really good question. Begins with a p- phobie, fobg. Fobg, fobg valley. Okay, and the voice that you hear is that um, of? Uh, well, my name is Adrian Stock, otherwise known as Aid from the Sunny 16 podcast. So, um, yeah, guess what? We are here with uh, 10 people traveling through, well, to- 13 in total, plus two Bhutanese guides traveling through Bhutan. And uh, turns out there is another podcaster on the, on the team here. And uh, what is the Sunny 16 podcast? Oh, well, the Sunny 16 podcast is a podcast we put out weekly, um, and it simply is about film photography, and it's named after the Sunny 16 rule of exposure. Why not Looney 11? <laughs> yeah, actually, we did think about calling it Sunny 11 because it never gets to Sunny 16 in the UK. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a bit of a lie, actually. Yeah, maybe you get a Sunny 16 somewhere like California or something like that, but not at home. <laughs> okay. Um, so what, what, yeah, you talk about photography, about uh, film photography, mostly analog. Yeah, well, there's three of us on the team, uh, myself and Graham and Rachel. Um, uh, Graham and I are both very spirited amateurs and enthusiasts. Um, uh, I uh, uh, I may be the less experimental one. Graham likes to experiment with all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, Rachel is actually a professional educator and analog photographer. Uh, and she does all sorts of things like cyanotypes and tin types. And she teaches school children all about analog stuff, which is fantastic. Awesome. So what, what kind of stuff um, would I hear on Sunday 16? Well, uh, we like to talk about different films, different cameras occasionally, but m- more than the kit, it's about you know, photography itself. So uh, our own adventures and experimentation, uh, different types of photography, things like pinhole, uh, instant film, uh, alternative processes. Uh, and we also like to make it a community thing. Uh, we have guests. Uh, we like to have guests who are from other communities as well, a bit like yourself. <laughs> oh, does that mean I can come on the show? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, of course you can. Absolutely, you would be most welcome. Uh, and uh, you know, we've we've had guests uh, like uh, M from Emulsive.org, which is a a big website dedicated to analog photography, uh, and others as well. Just uh, um, so uh, we've had uh, Justin Quinnell, who is uh, I think probably a almost world renowned uh, academic and uh, pinhole photographer. He does things like uh, make cameras out of beer cans using. Um, uh, using paper rather than film and he sticks them up for six months and creates solar graph so all, mm-hmm. all sorts of interesting stuff very cool so you came uh with what kind of uh, with what kind of photo gear do you come to this bhutan tour which we're not even i think we're just like not even halfway through right I think no, not quite. Uh, yeah. It feels like we've been here for quite we've, a long we've, time. We've, we've, we've had such <laughs> packed days. We actually met the the, uh, the bulk of the group in Kathmandu before the tour, mm-hmm. so we had a day tour in Kathmandu, and then we made it through um, to Paro and uh, oh, I forget these names. Um, Paro to Timpu. Timpu, of course, Timpu. The capital of Bhutan. Yeah. Uh, you know, this capital of Bhutan, uh, famous for not having any traffic lights at all. And, uh, and a really fun uh, traffic policeman who guides the, the traffic with weird motions. Yeah, he, he, he's definitely had some dancing education. He's, so, uh, <laughs> his moves are smooth. <laughs> so so I, I, I've seen you um, use cameras that are a bit different from, the most other, from most of the other cameras that are here on the tour yeah so i've come with essentially a 35 millimeter film kit um i have a couple of identical nikon slrs uh they date, which ones uh the nikon fe2 uh dates back to uh about the mid 80s and uh it, it you could think of it as as the uh, the canon 5d equivalent of the day mm-hmm. you know it was the one step down from the 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 yeah, the real top of the range programmer and these things are bulletproof i mean they're fantastic cameras uh, they shoot aperture priority uh, and i've brought uh, some film i know how to use kodak hector and i've bought some slightly uh, less uh, unusual film. <laughs> well, it, it, well unusual to me let's say so i have uh, some uh, lomo red scale uh, to play with just a little bit of that but i've also bought which i'm really looking forward to seeing the results from uh, some kodak vision 3 250 daylight film 
Uh, this is a, a movie film. It, it, it's designed to go in movie cameras. Uh, and uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of that. And, and it needs some, some special processing. Yeah, it has a coating on it um, to make it go through the movie cameras. Because it goes at the mo through movie cameras at speed. Uh, it needs to be a little bit more robust than normal 35mm film. And uh, they have a coating on it called Remjet. Um, which then needs to be removed by the lab. So when I get home, I will send it to a lab that knows how to do that. Um, because if you put it through a normal machine, it'll clog up the machine, and the and the lab will hate you forever. <laughs> yeah. Then and it's and it's. I think it's it's it colors. It's weird color, and I don't I don't think it's even translucent. No, no, the backing. It's like black. Yeah, the the backing is is opaque, so yeah. you, you can't see through it. Um, so it does need to be sort of scrubbed and removed um, <laughs> as part of the development process. Well, but there are labs that do that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. There, there's a there's a lab. Am I allowed to do a shout out? Of course, of course you can. Okay, so I bought my film from a, a, a group called Nick and Trick, uh, which is a, a shop and online uh, presence in the UK. Uh, they buy this film in bulk. Uh, they hand roll it into 35 mil cartridges awesome. themselves. Oh, yeah, it is awesome and when I get home I'll send it right back to them they'll take it out they'll clean it up develop it scan it and send it back to me so you know it's a it's a full service for those uh, people who'd like to try the film but maybe a little bit nervous of it uh, there are full services out there that you can make use of so you brought two Nikon FEs mm -hmm. <clears throat> you brought different kinds of film stock Now, uh, on this tour, you are surrounded by digital photographers. I am. <laughs> what, is, what is that? I mean, tell, tell me a bit about how does that feel? Because everyone's like showing pictures and downloading things through the laptops and working on them and showing the backs of the cameras. And you're like, the, yeah, hmm, what? Well, it, it works both ways. There, there are good things about it and bad things about it. Um, uh, I, I prefer uh, shooting with film cameras uh, for a number of reasons, and most of them are the cliches that people will mention. Uh, you know, it slows me down, therefore I'm thinking more, and I take better photos. Um, what have I missed out on? Um, not, not a lot, really. Um, we, you know, when it gets dark, it's a little bit trickier. So we've been inside some temples, uh, mm -hmm. watching uh, ceremonies uh, for monks praying. Um, that, yeah, there's a bit dark in there. It's uh, very, it's a very Buddhist country, so <clears throat> those those temples can be a bit darkish on the inside. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the farmhouse we visited today, <laughs> uh, local farmhouse, quite dark in there as well. So you get down to some pretty show slow, sorry, slow shutter speeds. Uh, doing that uh, which i compensate for by having fast primes so yeah the upside or or, or or get the camera shaken declared art oh <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not that experimental i'd still prefer it to be sharp um other than that what's the difficulties i don't know carrying lots of film is quite bulky okay so you, you travel with film uh you have to get it through the x-ray machines at the airports and things mm -hmm. um <clears throat> have you done that before Yeah, I have. Um, but, I, but, you, but you don't have like ISO 1600, 3200 film with you? No, no, I'm shooting 100 and 250 speed mm. film. Um, I've traveled, actually I've done tests traveling uh, with 400 speed film, put it through lots of airport scanners and it's been fine. Okay. So my own personal experience is anything up to 400 <clears throat> is perfectly okay to travel with. Um, so that, you know, I, I didn't bring any this time. But, but of uh, course you didn't check any in... No, no, I wouldn't check in there. I, I, anecdotally, uh, I understand that uh, the scanners that they put your checked baggage through, uh, the scanning power is a lot higher uh, and is you know, I, very much more likely but, to, to fog the film. But there's <clears throat> one other uh, participant here of the group who has some analog with him, and that's Olaf. And Olaf brought an Instax mini camera, mm. which is... Well, the, I don't know the exact na name, but it's the one with the built-in printer. It's a digital camera and it has an Instax printer built in. So you can shoot on the digital camera and you can print out individual pictures to Instax um, instant film. And uh, his 10 packs of Instax that he brought, he checked them in. He put them in the big uh, luggage scanners. And uh, I, I told him, ah, I'm not sure if that was a good idea. <clears throat> so he, in, in, when he came here, he immediately took one out and take, took a test shot. And it looks okay. He seems to have gotten away with it, which I, I don't <clears throat> really understand, to be honest, because it's 800 speed film and it's been through you know, really powerful x-ray machines. So I, I don't know, maybe, maybe instant film is different than regular film. We're, we're talking bigger surface, we're talking... Mm -hmm. Uh, a much bigger surface than a negative, uh, 35mm negative. So maybe 
I don't know distributes better or i don't know uh, maybe it does i mean i have done some traveling within stacks mini um and uh, just in my carry-on and that's traveled fine as well so maybe it's just a little bit less susceptible to it um that camera of olaf's though um he is just making so many friends isn't it amazing the amount of smiles you see when he when he takes a picture of someone and goes wait wait and Prints it out and hands it over to them. It's it's astonishing. I mean, I I love Instax myself. I I love shooting with instant film, um, and I do it exactly for that reason to make people smile. Yeah. Um, I shot a, a corporate event uh, a few weeks ago uh, in support of Rachel, my colleague on the podcast, uh, and um, I was her second shooter, and uh, it was so much fun. We had people from all over the world at this event, um, and they kept coming back. It was an evening party. They kept coming back to have their photo taken with other people and uh you know the smiles on their faces were awesome you'd never have had that with digital photography so olaf is making a lot of friends right now which is great <laughs> very cool um <clears throat> so a few thoughts about bhutan a few thoughts about bhutan. yeah you've you've have you ever been in this part of the world no no i haven't so i number uh, this is time to fess up isn't it i've never been on a photographic let's, tour before let's, let's walk over there <laughs> just just so we don't annoy anyone because we're standing here out on on the aisle in front of the hotel rooms um which is by the way interesting um this is uh i can't re i can't upload this recording straight away because we're in the one hotel on this tour that doesn't have wi-fi and at this point not even electricity <laughs> Well, absolutely. So I'm a bit smug at the moment because I don't need to charge my batteries. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and everyone's like, yeah, hopefully. But some, there's some construction going on and they, they seem to be switching it on and off at will uh, at, at whenever they want. And Well, well yeah. So I, I've uh, never been on a photo tour before. Uh, I've never been to this part of Asia before. Um, and uh, so this is all new to me. Um, uh, it's... Uh, I, I'm astonished um the 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 saying is that i've heard uh about bhutan and maybe some which other i told you <laughs> which you may have told me yes is you you uh you you come for the mountains and you stay for the people uh and you know i what be five days in at the moment and i that i'm a complete convert for that uh the people here are amazing uh not just the people who are helping us out guiding us around the country but the local people uh we were all yeah the, the national sport of bhutan being archery uh and and the second <laughs> national sport being darts i guess <laughs> yeah yeah um we went to a uh, we went to a, a little village uh, a couple of evenings ago uh to practice archery in rice paddy fields um the whole village came out to watch us uh, us crazy tourist no, foreigners they, they, they came to laugh about us okay they came to laugh at us at us not about at us, us at us, at us. us. Okay. definitely okay. at us and so we provided them with some great entertainment uh, and they provided us with great hospitality and photo ops and photo ops yeah uh, yes the I mean, the people here, it, it's a different culture for photography here. People are not used to seeing tourists, people or not so much anyway. And, and you know, they're very welcoming. Um, you know, the, the, the country hasn't been saturated and that's a really, really good thing. The way the government controls tourism in Bhutan uh, seems to be working from what I can see. Um, we are welcomed, uh, uh, we are guided and the photography opportunities are extraordinary <laughs> okay um we've moved inside it was cold outside and now we're inside in the <laughs> not so bright room because of the electricity showing out this is this is something that in, in other places of the world i would be sort of miffed about but here it's i mean, we kind of knew this one guest house in between would be a bit simpler and um didn't expect much and it was m way more than i expected so, yeah, you go with the flow. Yeah, I mean, it, it's part of the fabric, isn't it? I mean, you know, to, to paint a picture, I suppose, we've travelled here um, quite some hours uh, on a bus, uh, a sort of small coach, um, because the roads, uh, a lot of the roads we've come across are unmade. Uh, they're, they're fairly firm at the moment because it's not raining, but, you this, know, they're this, not tarmac. This, so. this, 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 uh, this part of the world has monsoon season. And that means that uh, you get landslides, you get uh, roads underwater, but it's fairly, it's it's good. We, we are in, the, in here in the dry season now. October, November, December is dry, and warmer than I thought. 
Yes, I, I brought lots and lots of cold weather gear and I thought at first I wasn't going to get to use it. But actually, uh, as we record this, we're now at 3,200 metres, which is just over 10,000 feet for American listeners. Uh, and it's cooling down some. Uh, it's been nice and sunny today, but as soon as you get out of the sun, it's quite cold. So, you know... The further east we get... The, the more cold it gets here. Yeah. That's, that's my understanding. Uh, and we're getting higher and higher as well. So, you know, if we come along unmade roads, we're, we're not quite in the Himalayas, but the Himalayan foothills, I suppose. Yeah, we're at 3,200 metres. Um, it's not surprising if the electricity goes out every now and again, and you just have to roll with it. <laughs> that's why I bring a couple of extra spare batteries, a power bank, as I can see one lying here. Um, so to charge your your smartphone and stuff, um, yeah. But that's that's the next next hotel. I believe is going to have Wi Fi again, so I might be able to upload this episode. Um, so our goal, uh, our our <clears throat> well, not not that I mean the way is the goal, right? But our goal for this tour is Boomtang, which is further in the east and um, some festival there. So uh, we we still have a good bit of driving to do and a bit of photo ops, but so far it's been amazingly packed every day was full with a lot of activities and a lot of things to see is there anything that sticks out to you anything that you that really captured your your imagination Uh, i think at the risk of repeating myself it's the chances we've had to meet people okay so they're the people that helped us with the archery the people in in the local farmhouse uh you know we had an opportunity to go to a school today uh we've been to several monasteries where we've been very welcomed um if i could pick one we did a hike a few days ago uh, a very breathless hike because it took us up to 3500 meters which was new to me uh and on the way down we stopped at a, a tiny little monastery uh actually probably more of a temple than a monastery uh and there were only a few monks in attendance there um, and completely uh, unscheduled, unasked for, uh, they brought us out some food and some very hot, sweet tea, uh, and they fed us. And we sat there in the sunshine, you know, on the top of this mountain in the beautiful you know, uh, garden of a, of a temple. Uh, and the monks treated us like royalty. I think, you know, that for me kind of sums up my first few days experience of Bhutan at the moment. It's an awesome place. And it's and it's not it's not artificial. I was I was afraid before. I, I was here the first time two years ago, and I was afraid. Oh, the kingdom of happiness and the gross national happiness and the. I, I thought this was like some spiel for tourists, and uh, coming here and experiencing this experiencing this firsthand, it, it's just there's as real as it gets. I yeah. Yeah. I would completely agree with that. Everybody we've met has been completely friendly and seems to have no other motive to, you know, no axe to grind. Um, it's it's a wonderful welcome. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> the photography, we are uh, in the no, name forgotten again, the valley that... Uh, Pop G. Pop G. Pop G. Ka. Pop G. Ka, Pop G. I think is... Uh, the name and uh, and it's the valley of the black necked cranes which we were hoping to meet here because uh, end of october is when they return from tibet they fly to tibet over the summer and then they come back to um, stay here over the winter and it's a it's a wide valley it's got some some marshland some wetland here that they that they need to to breed and to to survive and uh, even though there are some predators, there are some snow leopards that apparently come down from the mountains overnight sometimes. Um, they seem to be, uh, yeah, th- this is one of the places. There are, We were at the Crane Information Center today and learned all this. There are over 500 cranes here in Bhutan usually uh, when they come back from Tibet. And this valley will hold 400 of them. So it's quite a big number. Um, but... <sighs> Timing was slightly off. They can arrive every day, any day, but they are, haven't arrived yet. I've, I've, I found this impressive. It, it is. Um, it's a good example of, of a number of conservation works we've seen going on throughout the country, isn't it? So, you know, we've got this uh, information centre. They, they rescued a crane who, who landed here last year uh, and uh, broke his wing. 
Um, and so rather than you know letting him try and fly off and damage himself more, uh, they took care of him. Uh, we saw him today. They, they've kept him for a whole year. And I think, um, assuming he's fit enough, they're, they'll aim to release him back in with the rest of the cranes oh, okay. this year. Um, so, you know, I think, it, you know, it's, again, it's, it's an, a, good, a good example uh, of some other things that we've seen. I mean, Bhutan, I'm told, has over 70% uh, forestry coverage. I think uh, seventy-five. That's what I heard, and they have like, they have a set minimum that they have to have the country covered with, which is over sixty percent. They they do, and they have a national. Uh, is it uh, uh, forestry day? Forestry Social day. forestry day. Something weird, but but pretty much that's that's when they all go out and plant trees. Yeah, and everybody in the nation has to do it. You yeah, know? and um, so yeah, all of these things. You know, the the well, they have to do it, but but I have the feeling those who want to do it. Oh, I'd agree with that. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't. Whoever we talk to about this doesn't sound like they that they don't like doing this. No, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of balance. I think here a lot of um, social awareness, a lot of environmental awareness. Um, possibly that stems from uh, yeah, having a, a very high proportion of the population being Buddhists. Uh, you know, it, 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 you know, from my, the little I understand about Buddhism, although I've learned a lot in the last few days, <laughs> uh, you know, the, you know uh, managing the world, retaining balance uh, as a person and for the whole world itself is a key part of it. Uh, and that very much is part of day to day life here. It's it's completely Buddhism is completely interwoven into everything here in the country. Um, you will see not just little temples and stupas and things along the road on in the middle of the road, and you have to drive around them on the right side, of course, which which is the left side here. Um, but also the 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 whole the, the the whole. I mean, there's no separation between government and religion here. There is a king. And the king is loved by everyone. They hang pictures up. I don't think they have to, but there are pictures of the king everywhere. Um, and then there's a chief abbot who is the religious or the, the spiritual leader of the country. And they apparently have the same status, the same level of power, um, as I understand it. And then there are the zongs, which are the fortresses. Um, and there are quite a few across the country. And they used to be... Uh, well, fortresses against Tibetan invasion, and they have uh, now have the function of, uh, first of all, being administrative buildings, but also being monasteries. So you, you you go in there as a visitor, and you will see officials with their garb on, and you can kind of tell if you know the the different colors what they mean, and you can see this is a top official or a medium official or something, and then you go inside that zong that that fortress, you go one. Um, one courtyard on, and then you're in the monastery. Uh, yes, there there is no separation. I, I read a, an article on the plane on on the way in uh, that about the Bhutanese flag, which is, is cut in half and, and diagonally, the, diagonally, uh, and the top half is yellow, which represents uh, the king, who is uh, the head of the government, and the bottom half is orange, which represents uh, the chief abbot, who is the head of uh, the, the church, I guess, for want of a better term. Um, that's a bad term, but there we go. Um, and uh, they they are peers. The king and the chief abbot are peers, um, and the two things are inseparable. And it creates uh, a culture I've never experienced before. Um, I, I'm I'm really glad I came. <laughs> and I hope I'll still be saying that in two, in another week's time. But there we go. <laughs> and then on the flag, there is a white uh, drawing of uh, a dragon, the national dragon, the the druk. And um, that goes back to a design that was made by the Divine Madman. You didn't know uh, that. We've, we've heard some stories about him, haven't okay. we? Okay, <laughs> everyone, everyone hit the pause button, Google the Divine Madman, which is, um, well, a monk who, who lived here in, the, I think, the 15th century and who... Um, well, I, I'm not sure how to explain him. Can you do this? A, this is th this show. I, I, I'd be happy if this show gets an explicit tag. <laughs> okay, all right. You want me to do this one, do you? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> That's because I'm not a native speaker. Okay, so I will try and retell the story as it was told to us by by our Bhutanese guides. 
the divine madman uh, was a, essentially a traveling monk and he brought some new ideas about buddhism uh, at the time uh, and uh, apparently he was a man of of uh, great appetites appetites for food appetites for the ladies uh, and uh, you know this was quite a shocking behavior to people at the time uh, but he had some teachings uh, that, that went along with it uh, and made some sense um uh, they they asked him to um they asked him to prove himself, I believe, by by doing a miracle. Oh, that was the 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 the, um, the, the evil spirit that he. Yes, there did, was, it, did, wasn't it. Wasn't it something about an evil spirit that he had to fight? There was a there. Yes, there was actually uh, the, the and I think I'm not sure quite if I'm remembering this correctly. Um, they they um, they sat him down and and, and for, for dinner and said, you know, t show us a miracle, master. And so he ordered for his own dinner a whole cow of that, <laughs> yes, and a whole goat, yes, and uh, and he ate them both uh, in one sitting. But, but Everything but the bones. Everything but the bones. All that was left at the end was a clean bone. Uh, um, now, that wasn't necessarily the whole of the miracle because what he then did to prove that you know, he was a master uh, was he took the skull of the goat and he joined it to the body of the cow and said something along the lines of stand up and walk and uh, a new animal was created. And this animal is... The, Do you know the name? Uh, it is called a takim, I think. Is it the takim? Takim or takin. And it, uh, it kind of looks like a cow with a goat's head. It, it really does look like <laughs> a cow with a goat's head. And it is the national animal of Bhutan. Yeah. So that's one of the cleaner stories we could tell about the divine madman. Well, the, I think I might have dodged a bullet there. Let's, you, you, have, you have dodged a bullet. The, the, other, the, other, the other the stories have to do with um, male reproduction organs and... And lots of them. So if you if you read up on the Divine Madman, you will find out a lot about this. Um, the, the one th the one thing that you see about this now in Bhutan is that there are lots of buildings with uh, depictions of penises. Yes, uh, and uh, penises carved from wood. And uh, yeah. yes, the the uh, the phallus has a a significant. Um, a uh, significant significance um uh in Bhutanese culture uh and it's a sign of luck um i believe yes the 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 other story about the divine madman where he was asked to to fight a beast that's the one i i was kind of steering towards which you which which you dodged was that he was um he he fought a, an evil spirit he fought an he fought an evil spirit and his weapon was his phallus which spat fire <laughs> That's pretty much the short of it, yes. It is. Um, so uh, uh, without going into too much of the gory detail, uh, the phallus is, is now a, a symbol of power and fertility uh, for many Bhutanese. And uh, where we were in uh, Punaka uh, a couple of days ago, particularly, mm. um, it is, is a centre for um, uh, th those kinds of, of beliefs and observances. So many, many of the buildings have uh, quite detailed and, and in some cases quite comic uh, depictions of and, phalluses and on the large. side of buildings very large yes yes um, <laughs> some of them a couple of meters long on yes. the side of a building uh, so very colorful uh, somewhat cartoonish uh, uh, quite energetic paintings of phalluses on the outsides of buildings uh, uh, for fertility and for luck yeah and as I can see from here um, the, the, what, what a lot of Bhutanese do is they hang off the four corners of their houses they hang sculptures of phalluses just to keep the evil spirits out yes so it's uh, it's uh, <laughs> a it's, an interesting it's view on the world <laughs> it's an interesting view on the world it is um it is funny for the tourists um, that that village that we visited is probably has probably some of the most photographed phalluses in the world um and um, i'm i'm sure I'm, I, i will sure post a few in, in appropriate places um, so yeah That's 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 a fun thing about Bhutan it, from it, our perspective. From the Bhutanese perspective, it's perfectly normal. Yes, although they have a great sense of humor. Our guides who have been taking care of us for the last week, uh, they do have a great sense of humor, and they absolutely know all the jokes. <laughs> so, and they're perfectly comfortable with it. And you know, so uh, I think they they find. I think the, the humor in it for them is the way that we react to it, like a bunch of school children. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. How can we wrap this one up? 
Well, we've got a long day tomorrow, haven't we? Um, unfortunately, there's some unavoidable travel to do, but I'm really looking so- looking forward to excited to get to, to Bumtang and to see the festivals. There'll be lots of dancing, lots of music. Uh, so then there should be yet another different type of cultural experience for us, uh, much more formal this time, uh, I think, rather than the, the very close to the, the, the uh, normal people that we've been um, having experienced so far. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, it's going to round it off nicely, I think, before we fly back to Paro and, uh, and spend another three nights there. Oh, and spend another three nights there. Oh, we've got the Tiger's Nest as well, haven't we? Got we got the hike to Tiger's Nest coming up. So this is this is by far not over. Really. Tiger's Nest is one a longer hike to uh, an, a monastery that is high up in the mountains. It's a it's almost a miracle. Um, we have more time in, in 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 Paro to do some well some. And, and end of this tour, you know, this hotel here, it's a bit simpler, but then the end of the last three nights, we're going to have like some luxury and a bit of uh, relaxation and shopping. Oh, I look forward to that then. <laughs> we'll need it by then. Uh, yeah, the way that uh, the way that we are finding new things to do on the fly every day to fill in the days. Our guides are working around the clock, I think. These guys uh, are awesome. Um, uh, Finn and Chime. Finn and Jimmy, yeah, shout out to Finn and Jimmy because they're working very hard and they're being very flexible with our itinerary. Um, uh, when we stop for 90 minutes to take photographs of a tree, uh, they're very understanding and patient and uh, they reorganize they, our itinerary around us. They usually don't have photographers. So um, when we did that first hike, they um, announced it as a two and a half hour hike and it ended up being more of like a five hour hike. So... Um, yeah, they have they have now adjusted their their they have a correction factor now for photographers. Uh today's today's um forecast for the hike was spot on, so they they are doing an amazing job. All right. That was it for this episode of Tips on the Top Floor. A different one. I'll uh, skip the usual outro music and just say goodbye and uh take care until next week. Happy shooting. Happy shooting. Wait, wait, wait. Before we leave just one last thing again. Where can people find you and your your podcast? <laughs> well, thank you so much for asking. Uh, we are the Sunny 16 podcast and you can find us just by searching for that on iTunes. Uh, we also have uh, our most active uh, social networks are Instagram and Twitter, uh, where you again, we are just simply Sunny 16. Uh, we we you know, by, by using one of those links, you'll find just a link to our normal feed. If you don't happen to be an iTunes user, we have a, a normal RSS feed for the podcast so uh, please download it and enjoy uh, we've been working at this now uh, we haven't missed a week yet and we've been going uh, well over a year and a half i think the show that i'm the shows that i'm missing out on by being here and having fun in bhutan are shows 74 and 75 i think so if you're the sort of person that likes a back catalog there's one of those as well <laughs> all right bye bye now bye bye <laughs>